Hallelujah. Let Lord Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Welcome to another live stream with DCCI Ministries to follow up what the author of the Quran is going to tell us today. <laughs> Peace of Christ with you, Robert. How are you doing? And with your spirit. It's very good to see you, Hatun. Thank you all as well. Um, I am good by God's grace. God is good, so I am good. Um, I think you just become like a little bit more famous by publishing another book or finishing another book. Uh, what have you been up to these days? Yes, this book is just out. Muhammad, a critical biography. I don't know if that's visible. Little but, bit up, uh, up. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. Uh, it is a biography of Muhammad from the earliest Islamic sources, and a lot of people might think, but we've heard all this. We know what a terrible person he was, and that's true. That's all in this book, but uh, uh, including some that I think will surprise a lot of people. But also, this book is a historical exploration of uh, the Islamic tradition so that people can see how much it's full of contradictions and inconsistencies and it's presented to us by the Islamic apologists as if it's one coherent story, but it's actually all kinds of disparate stories that don't hang together and contradict each other. And then the standard narrative was constructed out of that. But really, when you go back into the records, you don't even have consistency about his name, because some traditions say he was originally named Kutam and then became Muhammad later. Um, so there are lots of biography of Muhammad. Um, one of the earliest one kind of attributed to the Ibn Isaac, and then we've got 21st century Muslim missionary biography. Uh, the most famous one is, is the Nectar of Prophet or something. Um, the seal so, of Nectar, yeah. The seal of the Nectar. So uh, the one you put together is that something like shows us standard narratives has holes in it or uh, why are we not satisfied the biography is out there that you decided to put together one since yes. I don't think like you kind of um, deceived people and then introduced Muhammad a little bit lovely and nicer version so I'm kind of thinking you just looked at the sources so why did we need <laughs> new <laughs> why did we need new one why did that's a very good question because there are plenty of them out there but this is the first and only one that I know of that compares the different versions of the stories to each other and shows how much it all differs. I mean, like we take for granted, for example, that Muhammad was in Mecca for 12 years and then in Medina for, one, for 10. But even that is disputed. And there are all kinds of different versions which say, no, 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 he was in one for this, this number of years and then the other for this number of years. And there's no consistency at all. Uh, we take for granted that Gabriel is the angel who supposedly appeared to him. But other versions say it was Saraphel and then Gabriel replaced Saraphel after three years. Now, see, if, it, if, if Muhammad was a real person who was claiming that Gabriel had appeared to him, why would anybody make up other stories saying it was a different angel? But if Muhammad is a composite made up of lots of different stories of different people that were then put together and assigned to Muhammad, then you have to explain why in some cases there are stories that mention a different angel and things like that. So there are attempts to harmonize that are still in the tradition. So I am assuming a um, book can be bought in Amazon or where do we buy the book? Yes, it can be bought at Amazon, at Barnes & Noble. If there are any bookstores out there, ask them to order it, and it's out there. So I guess expectation is once we read the book, we won't only think Muhammad has holes in his biography, but also we will come out as like, well, which, whom, which version should we trust? So since you are comparing different versions. It's just like the Quran. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so it's not only you are the author of the Quran, but now you are the author of the biography of Muhammad. So you are putting Islam together. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, building the, the Hadith myself. Yes. Uh, I don't know of uh, Sarafel in the Bible. I can't think of any passage in which he's there. You might have to ask Sam Shamoon about that because 
he's got the whole Bible in his head. But uh, I can't I, I, I can't think of any passage offhand. I don't know where Sarafel the name comes from. Might come from Jewish tradition. Yeah, but not um, introduced as the angel of the Lord in the Bible. So that's something. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, so um, people, please um, check the uh, check Amazon and then go and get the critical biography of Muhammad. And then we have more uh, more questions about Islamic tradition as we try to kind of engage with our Muslim friends. And uh, last time we kind of talked about uh, this is our third session for the Surah Two. In the first uh, part, we talked about how Allah intentionally kind of predestined people to suffering, how Allah intentionally uh, choose people who are going to choose him or not choose him, all that. And then last week we continue to talk about um, how suddenly Islam talks about from the time of Moses, while he's talking about Muhammad and then jumps to the time of, Mo sorry, from creation to time of Moses. And um, now we are, we are, I think, still in the time of Moses. Um, before I kind of jump into verse 55, is there anything you would like to mention that you kind of thought, oh, maybe I should have mentioned that last week, I forgot about it, or we just jump into it? Yeah, I think let's jump. Okay, so we are picking up from Surah 2, verse 55. And when you said, oh Moses, we will not believe in you until we see Allah plainly. And while you watched, the lightning strikes you. When we received you after your death, so that you might give thanks. We revived you after your death. So Moses was struck dead by lightning and then revived. This is like, do we identify this as the uh, miracles of Islam or? Uh, apparently, but uh, we don't have any understanding. We don't have any evidence for that outside. This is not in the Bible. And we don't have any uh, tradition of Moses being killed and brought back to life, struck by lightning and brought back to life. So this, I don't know where this comes from. Maybe there is some Jewish tradition about this, but uh, it, it seems could just so, be a misunderstanding. So it seems like um, interesting to me while Moses is kind of coming back, like after being struck and then coming back to life, Allah was quite okay for Muhammad to suffer for three years and not do anything about it or like not even try to bring him back. But also Islamic Moses is powerful. Like he fights with the angel of the death and then angel of the death gets afraid in one point. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's like uh, Jesus also who uh, is born of a virgin, is sinless and returns at the end of the world. And yet Muhammad is supposed to be superior. These things are flat inconsistencies in Islamic tradition. Beautiful and beautiful. <laughs> and we cause the white cloud to overshadow you and send down the manna and quills upon you. Eat of the good things with which we have provided you. They did not wrong us, but they did wrong themselves. And when we said, go into the, this town and eat freely of the what is there and enter the gates prostrating and say repentance we will forgive you your sins and we will more we will more to those who do right but those who did wrong exchanged to the word and that had been told them for a, another saying and we have sent down wrath from heaven upon the evil door evil doors for their evil doing now and this that, is one of the passages that islamic apologists use to say see the Jews corrupted their scriptures, that uh, those who did wrong exchanged the word that had been told them for another saying. But of course, it's also inconsistent with the Quran saying that Allah's word cannot be changed. So how is it that they were able to exchange it for another saying at all? And that's not explained. It's also talking about like those who did wrong exchanged the word that had been told hold them for another thing it's just like if sake of the argument like if you want to give credit to muslims it is only talking about the verbal changes yes it doesn't actually say that the jews corrupted their scripture yeah. you have to have that in mind already and read it into the passage but the passage is only saying that they took the word they'd received and exchanged it for something else 
which could just mean that they rejected what Allah told them for some other teaching, but it doesn't necessarily mean they changed what Allah told them. Maybe it's also talking about context of the Quran, since Muslims change their word. Um, you read Islamic sources, if like, if it is not written um, in, before 650s, then we read from Islamic sources that Muslims were paying money to other Muslims to simply tear down their Quran. Like it was 60 dirham to just destroy the Quran. Maybe Allah is like foreseeing the future and then talking about the future, what Muslims are going to do. Indeed. Uh, verse 60 and when Moses asked for water for his people we said struck the rock with your stuff and there gushed out from the 12 springs each tribe knew its drinking place eat and drink of what Allah has provided and do not act corruptly spreading the corruption on earth there it is again corruption. that's the third mention of corruption on earth we're only 60 verses into the second chapter and we have three mentions of corruption on earth for which the punishment is in 533 uh crew being killed or crucified or your hands and feet cut off on opposite sides so the quran clearly has a uh, fascination with the disobedience of the unbelievers and with their punishment whereas as uh, i've said before the the Jewish and Christian scriptures aren't like that. The Bible is concerned with how human beings can have sinned and can be reconciled to God. And it's, it, it, it's a positive teaching, whereas the Quran is all about just denouncing those who reject it. In one side, we've got God who is reaching out to his people and then saying, turn to me, turn to me versus in here is I made you this way this way and I am gonna program you to spread corruption on the earth anyway and here's the your punishment yes and when you said oh Moses we are very of one kind of food so call upon your Lord for us that he would bring forth for us from the earth from what the earth grows of it herb it herbs it's cucumber, it's corn, it's lentils, it's onion. He said, which you exchange what is higher for what is lower, go down to the settled country. In this way, you in this way you will get what you are demanding. And humiliation and property strikes them. And they and they were visited with wrath from Allah. That was because they disbelieved in Allah's sign and killed the prophets wrongfully. That was for their disobedience and transgressions. This is a very important point. Humiliation and poverty struck them. The uh, people are being disobedient. They say they would rather have cucumbers and corn and lentils and onions than the, uh, uh, does it even say the manna? Yeah, it's, uh, manna talks about it a little bit earlier. Uh, was it in 59? uh 58, 57. 57 okay there we go the manna and the quails and they'd say no we want cucumbers and onions and so uh he gives them humiliation and poverty and this is a very important thing in the quran all the way through we'll see this repeated several times it's like everything else in the quran humiliation and poverty come to those who disobey allah allah blesses you in this world and the next if you obey him and curses you in this world and the next if you disobey him so in the psalms we read about how the wicked prosper and how sometimes the those who are evil come out on top and ecclesiastes says that the race is not to the swift and so on that sometimes those who are undeserving have success and those who are deserving do not and this is something that leads up to the cross of Christ and the resurrection, that he suffers, although he is completely sinless and blameless, and then conquers death by his death. In Islam, there's nothing like this. There's no idea that the good might suffer. Only the evil suffer. 
because Allah sends humiliation and poverty when you disobey. And you will suffer in this world and as well as in the next. So this creates a, a an ongoing impetus for fanaticism that you want to please Allah so you don't suffer in this world so you become more fanatical and maybe you have to kill or go jihad in some other way because you want to please Allah and you know that jihad is the highest deed that you can do for Allah so the absence of the idea that the wicked may prosper which is in the Bible in several places it creates a terrible cycle where you try to please Allah and you end up suffering. And so you try to please Allah all the more. And so you ultimately end up uh, becoming completely radicalized, as the term is nowadays, or going jihad in order to please Allah to try to improve your earthly situation. Whereas the Bible says there's no necessary connection between your earthly situation and your spiritual condition. So um, I hear quite a lot, especially these days, um, that people in Palestine are suffering. Uh, so is that because they've been disobedient to Allah and Allah is simply judging them? That's what the Quran would say. Okay. Can you think of a place where the Quran says that the righteous might suffer? There are several places where it says that the unrighteous will suffer in this world and the next, and that the righteous will be blessed in this world and the next. So where is there space? Where does it ever said that the righteous might suffer? So dear Muslims who are suffering, just reminded that Allah is very much happy with your suffering, and he's simply punishing you. Yes. <laughs> Enjoy it. Um, verse 62. Indeed, those who believe and those who are Jews and Christians and servants, who, whoever believes in Allah and the last day and does right, surely their reward is in their Lord and no, and no fear will come upon them, neither they will grieve. So this yeah. like looks very positive, positive yes. verse. Yeah, this is one of those verses that would be in the, uh, if, if we were to make an edition of the Quran that, was favorite verses of non-Muslim politicians in the United States. It, this would be one, and uh, the uh, 256, there is no compulsion in religion. And the 530, verse, chapter 5, verse 32, that uh, whoever kills an innocent person is as if he killed the whole world. Uh, that would be about it. But this verse is sometimes invoked as saying look the uh quran says that even if you're not a muslim you can be saved and isn't that generous and wonderful and if only the christians would be that generous and then say that muhammad is a prophet and that uh, muslims can be saved in the same way uh but actually that's not how it's understood in islamic tradition i have the critical quran here and in the note uh, I quote several uh, Islamic authorities. Kurtubi, he says that uh, this only applies to Jews, Christians, and Sabaeans who accept Islam. And when they not, become non-Christian, when they become non-Jews, then... Yes. Much, okay. And so that, I think, is the uh, primary understanding of it, that Christians, Jews, Christians, and Sabaeans can become, uh, can be saved if they become Muslim. So, in other words, it doesn't actually say that you can just be a Christian and be saved. That would go against all kinds of other things that are in the Quran. So, the verse talking about pe Jewish people, Christian people, and Sabaeans, who, who is this third group? Yes, uh, Ibn Kathir, he says, there is a difference of opinion as to the identities of the uh, identity of the Sabaeans. And he says some, uh, some Islamic authorities, he notes, they say that they're people who don't have a specific religion, but that doesn't seem right. And then he says other people say they're a sect among the people of the book who used to read the Zabur, the Psalms, and others say there are people who worship the angels or the stars. 
And now Sabaeans, the word means baptizers. And so it might be that they are uh, the Mandeans who are a, a sect that I exists to this day, although it's very small in, in uh, I believe, Iraq. And they, uh, they hold John the Baptist to be the great prophet and don't go beyond John the Baptist. So it could be that the Sabaeans as baptizers are the people we know of as Mandeans today. Um, so just a clarification question. Quran is talking about three people group, Jewish, Christians, and Serbians. And one of the giant mind of Islam, Ibn Kathir, is telling us, actually, we don't know who is this third group. Here is our some of our proposals. That's right. So okay. the clear book is, once again, not all that clear. Um, even Ibn Kathir couldn't explain it. So not. I'm not expecting more. Yes. Verse 63. And when we make a covenant with you and cause the mountain to tower above you, hold fast to what we have given you and remember what is in it, that you may fear Allah. Then even after that, you turned away. And if it, it had not been for the grace of Allah and his mercy, you would have not been among the losers. You would have been among the losers. Oh, sorry, you've been among the losers. So, uh, it, in this verse, it talks about grace of Allah. Is the definition yes. of the grace, is it the same in biblical sense? Like um, the gift that we don't deserve, but God generously gives to us, or Islam has different version, different definition for grace? It's really just uh, very simple. It's a cognate for favor uh, that Allah will give you prosperity in this world and the next as 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 I was just saying and that's what that would be grace so if you are a Muslim and you are very wealthy and have not suffered much in life you would say uh, Allah has given me his grace and so it, it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with salvation it's just a, a matter of Allah blessing you which is demonstrated by your earthly situation okay i read the verse again because um kind of the way i read it it changed the meaning so i'll read it again and then pick up from there and even after that you turned away and if it had not been for the grace of allah and his mercy you would have been among the losers and you know that you know about those among you who broke the sabbath how he said to them be apes, despised and hated. There you and go. Apes. So that is uh, the first of three passages that says that Allah transformed the Jews who were disobedient into apes. Now, we know that this is referring to the Jews because of 63. When we made a covenant with you, and we already had Allah speaking about Moses, and so it does seem as if that is the covenant in question. And caused the mountain to tower above you. That seems to be the mountain that uh, Moses climbed to speak with Allah, uh, which is not Mount Sinai in the Quran. And then you have him saying that you broke the Sabbath. And so obviously the Jews are enjoined to keep the Sabbath. So these are the Jews who are transformed into apes. And as we were discussing last week, there are some Muslims who take this quite seriously. Uh, Admiral Richard Burton in the 19th century actually encountered people in Arabia who told him that the local apes were Jews who had been transformed by the wrath of Allah into apes. And even today we have Hamas calling the Jews the sons of apes and pigs. There's actually disagreement in Islamic tradition as to whether this only referred to the apes, to the Jews of this day, or to all Jews. As in, are all Jews really apes? And there's serious discussion about this. Uh, or do they, are they people, they, they appear to be human beings, but they're actually apes? Or was this only these people who were right there at the time when Allah said this, that this refers to, and their children are not apes. 
and there's disagreement about this. I remember having a British Museum tour and one of the Muslim child asked me to show them examples of apes that Allah turned Jews to the apes. They mm -hmm. like child from very early age taught that and then they thought, oh yeah, they can see something mm -hmm. historical evidence in British Museum. Uh, do we have anything, are you aware if there is any writings before the Quran uh, using such a language for um, Jews? Not that I know of. There okay. may be some, but uh, I think this is something that is original to the Quran or to whatever source is being used to create the Quran here. Such a source of hate for um, human beings. Yes. Verse 66. And we made it an example to their own generation and to succeeding ones and a warning to those who fear Allah. And when Moses said to his people, indeed, Allah commands you to sacrifice a cow, they said, are you making fun of us? He answered, Allah forbid that I should be among the foolish. Note that that's the cow. That that's the, the title of the chapter. And it has nothing to do with anything. It's not an important part of the chapter. They could just as well have called it the apes. And it's, uh, it's a contradiction to the Islamic apologists who, who like to pretend that certain chapters of the Quran are honored, are honoring people by having their titles. The title is completely random. Yeah, but in this occasion, even the title is cow. It is not like, okay, nice cow meat. It's just like, okay, we are going to murder a cow. Yes. They said, pray for us to your Lord that he would make it clear to us what she is like. He answered, indeed, he says, truly, she is a cow that is either with a calf or immature, but between the two conditions. So do what you are commanded. They said, pray for us to your Lord that he would make it clear to us what color she is. He answered, indeed. He says, truly, she is a yellow cow. Her color is bright and pleasing to those who see her. They have two, two verses just discussing about the color of the cow and what kind of cow it is. Yes. Verses, you've got like some verses in the Quran which is like co affect the core doctrine of Christian faith. But there is only one verse and without no discussion, without no explanation. Yes. Well, this seems to be a story. Once again, we have the Quran referring to a story, assuming that the people who are hearing it know what's being talked about. But we don't know. Uh, and this cow, why is it so important? Why it be that it be sacrificed or what color it is? It's not explained. Well, nice yellow color. Yes. Maybe Allah wants, likes bright people. Yellow is actually a sign of friend, being friendly person. If you are yellow, that means like you are happy and you want to build friends. Apparently. Okay. Allah, may, Allah maybe wants to build friendship with that yellow cow. <laughs> they said, pray for us to your Lord that he would make it clear to us what kind she is. Indeed, cows are all much the same to us. And indeed, if Allah wills, we may be the led to the right path. He answered, indeed, he says, truly, she is a cow that is unyoked. She is not plowed the soil or the water, the field. She is a whole and without blemish, they said. Now, you are bringing the truth. So they sacrificed her, though they almost did not. And when they killed a man and disagreed about it and I'll and when they killed a man and disagreed about it, and Allah brought forth what they were hiding. And we said, strike him with some of it. In this way, Allah brings to the dead to life and show you his son so that you may understand. So see, the, now it's just getting very strange here because it says, when you killed a man and disagreed about it, and Allah brought forth what you were hiding, and we said, strike him with some of it. Some of what? We don't know. It's it, he, He's assuming that the people who are hearing know, but it's not explained. So in 7th century, 
Allah is talking about 1400 BC and Allah is assuming within uh, that over 2000 years, people, Muslim people, audience, this audience are knowing what Allah is talking about. Yes. Um, in verse 21, it looks like kind of cheated version of Deuteronomy chapter 13. Um, instead of, it, it needs to be lamb, but it's just like they just put it cow and then adopted with the cow definition. Yeah, that could be. And of course, there's the golden calf, but it's all an, it's all sort of garbled. You see, it doesn't it's 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 not a coherent narrative, and it doesn't even make sense in itself. So we are depend on Muslim scholars to explain and fill the gaps for uh, word of Allah. Exactly. Then even after that, your hearts were hardened and become as rocks, as rocks, or worse than rocks. For hard, hardness, for indeed they are the rocks from the river Gash, and indeed there are rocks that split into two so that the water flows from them, and indeed there are rocks that fall from the from down in the fear of Allah. Allah is not aware of what you do. He's Have not you, unaware. Yes. Yeah, he's unaware of what you do. Not unaware. Have you any hope that they will be true to you? when a party of them used to listen to the word of Allah and then used to change it knowingly after they had understood it. Okay, so here again, we have a suggestion that the Jews have changed the scripture they received, the Torah. Uh, but here again, it's not certain that that's referring to actually changing what is written in the scripture, but it's unclear. Nonetheless, this is one of the justifications, along with, I believe it was 59, yes, that's uh, used to say that the Jews and Christians have corrupted their scriptures. And they have to say that because the Quran elsewhere says that the Quran confirms the Torah and the gospel. And since it doesn't, it must the, the fallback explanation is that the Jews and Christians have corrupted their scriptures. They have, as it says here, they have changed the word of Allah knowingly after they have understood it. And it talks about a group of them did that. So people knew what the word of Allah is saying. They changed it knowingly. Yes. And only a group of them did. So um, what about the verse where it says like no one can change the word of Allah, even Muslims interpret, if the Muslims are interpreting this verse as a um, group of Jews changed the word of Allah? It's just a flat contradiction. There's no explaining, there's no reconciling that. Okay. That if they say the Jews change the word of Allah, and then nobody can change the word of Allah, then somebody's wrong, or they're both wrong, but they can't both be right. And so the idea that the Jews corrupted the word of Allah uh, contradicts the idea that nobody can do that. So you have in... Uh, 75, it doesn't actually say that they changed the written word. It says they listened to it and then would change it knowingly as if they listened to it and memorized it and then recited it back in a wrong way. But that wouldn't change the written word. Yeah. And yet that wouldn't, but if that's the explanation, then it doesn't explain why the, the Quran doesn't confirm the Torah as the Quran promises that it does. How about after Allah made Jews apes, apes were able to kind of play it around and then change it. They were very smart apes. Yeah, those are Muslim apes. Yes. And when they fall in with those who believe, they say we believe. But when they depart with each, when they depart with each other, they say, do you tell them what Allah has revealed to you so that they may argue with you about it before your Lord? Have you then no sense? Are they then unaware that Allah knows what they have kept hiding and what they proclaim? Among them are illiterate people who do not know the book except from heresy. Hearsay. They, heresy, sorry. Hearsay. They say they only guess. Therefore, woe to those who write the book with their hands and then they say, this is from Allah. 
that they may sell it for a small price. Woe to them for what their hands have written, and woe to them for that they have earned by it. Now, this is very interesting passage because it seems as if whoever's writing this is very angry with some people who have sold him the word of Allah and it turned out not to be. And so people who, uh, <coughs> excuse me, people who believe that Muhammad is the person to whom all, who is reciting all this, they have explained this as, uh, the Jews perhaps sold Muhammad to make fun of him some material that they said was the scripture, but it was just to, to, to mock him and show that he was not really a prophet, that he didn't even know that it was not the scripture. And that could have happened to one of the uh, people for whom the, who uh, is being written about that the material about him is being used in the story of Muhammad. But in any case, it does seem as if somebody is selling fake scriptures and who the Muslims are receiving them and are not happy. And so, however that, whoever the referent really is, it does seem as if uh, some kind of false prophet was being fooled by people who knew he was a false prophet. Some of his subscribers uh, walked out of Islam simply like, um, coming to the conclusion that they can actually reveal the word of Allah as well. Mm -hmm. This is a very interesting question you've got up on the screen. I, I forget that. Is it possible that the allegation against Christians changing their scriptures, scripture references the Syrian church abandoning the diatessaron in favor of the four gospels in the time of Rabula in 400 AD? Uh, and that is possible, actually. Uh, for those who may not know, there was an early Christian scholar, Tatian, who harmonized the four Gospels into what was called the Dia Tesseron, uh, that is that means from four. And so it is a single Gospel that is uh, made out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Syrian church used it originally, but then went back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as they were originally constituted. And so the person who's asking is wondering if this is what the reference is to the Christians changing the scriptures or to the changing of the scriptures. And remember what I was saying, I don't know if it was last episode or a couple of episodes ago, about the possibility that the mysterious letters that begin the chap some of many of the Quran chapters are actually uh, notations for liturgical use in a lectionary that you first read section Aleph and then section Lam and then section Mim. So it says at the beginning of chapter two of the Quran, Aleph, Lam, Mim. And so it's uh, that would actually support this idea that these are all Christian texts that were adulterated to create the Quran. And so it's a possibility. We can't say it for, cer for certain, but it's a possibility. Yeah. Um, just a side note, um, when we look at the uh, history of Islam, we get to see the corruption of the Christian scripture apparently appeared in mid 11th century. Before that, Muslims have full confidence that Bible is reliable word of God. Until 11th century, things changed from then. It's when they were encountering Christians in large numbers because of the Crusades. Yeah. So they and had they to come up with some explanation. Yeah, they were, not, they were not converting, so, okay, yeah. why they don't believe in Muhammad? And then they look into it, oh, Muhammad is not in the Bible. What is the yeah. best conclusion to arrive? They changed, they corrupted their scripture. Exactly. Um, verse 18, and they say, the fire will not touch us except for the certain number of days. Say, have you received a covenant from Allah? Indeed, Allah will not break his covenant or are you talking about something you do not know about no but whoever has done evil and his sin surrender, uh, surrenders him such people are rightful companions of the fire they will remain in it and those who believe and do good works 
such people are the rightful companions of garden. They will remain it. See, no. how encouraging these verses in it. What's that now? How encouraging this verse 82 is. Yeah, you know, it sounds like it is, but it's really terrible. Because you have the very simple, once again, it's all very simple. This is There's never anything very complicated in, in, in Islam, which is why it's so silly when Islamic apologists speak to non-Muslims and they say, you don't understand it. You have to know Arabic or you have to study uh, in, a, in, a, in a madrasa or something. You, you don't understand it. It's very difficult to grasp. It's actually all very simple. And so it's saying that if you have done evil, you'll be in, the, in hell. And if you've done good, you'll be in paradise. And that sounds great, except for the fact that nobody can say that they have always done good works. And this is the conundrum that the Quran presents but never solves. That everybody has done evil or sinned at some point. As the letter to the Romans tells us, all have sinned and, show, and, and fallen short of the glory of God. Consequently, there isn't anyone in the entire world, no matter how zealous a Muslim he is, who can say, I have always believed and done good works, and therefore I am the rightful companion of the garden. Every last Muslim has to be in mortal fear that he's going to end up in hell. And there's no salvation in Islam. There's no solution to that. The only thing we get that's close to it is suicide bombing. Yeah. Where in chapter 9, verse 111, it promises paradise to those who kill and are killed for Allah. And in chapter 4, verse 100, it promises great reward to those who emigrate for Allah, who moved to a new land in order to bring Islam to it. So you can get a great reward from Allah, guaranteed, if you emigrate to a new land to bring Islam to it, as we see many Muslims doing today. Or you can guarantee your place in paradise by killing and being killed. But otherwise, you don't know. You have no idea when you read this passage if you're on the one side or the other and you know everybody has sinned you know that and so everybody can look into his or her heart and say i am a rightful companion of the fire and the, uh, islam offers no respite no no refuge from that so because islam doesn't allah doesn't um, give the insurance for these beautiful gardens therefore we are not surprised to see Muslims who want to kill in the name of Allah or want to get killed in the name of Allah, mm -hmm. as well as Muslims who chooses to move to different land to spread Islam are kind of choosing those ways because Islam doesn't offer that. Allah by himself doesn't offer them ticket to their gardens. Um, they kind of do their part so that they get into garden by killing in his name or moving to different country. Yes. And so that's uh, really a terrible passage. Out of all the terrible passages that we've read so far, this one condemns every last person on earth to hellfire and does not offer any way to escape it because nobody believes and does good works unanimously and at all times without any exception. Like not knowing what's going to happen in an hour or next week is already scary by itself in this world. But mm -hmm. for Muslims to not know where they are going to end up for eternity is much more scary. So therefore, they choose the ways to know how to get there. That is simply killing in his name, killing in the name of Allah or moving to different countries. It is, it is not a good place to be. So therefore, yeah. I guess... In one sense, we can understand why Muslims are kind of killing in the in, um, name of Allah, uh, why they are doing what they are doing. Yes. Verse 83. And when we, are, when we were 
when we made a covenant with the children of Israel, worship no one except Allah and be good to your parents and relatives and to the orphans and to the needy and speak kindly to mankind and establish prayer and give alms. Then after that, you turn back except for a few of you as you are backsiders. And when we made a covenant with you, do not shed the blood of your people, nor turn your people out of your homes. Then you ratified it, and you were witness. Yet it is you who kill each other and expel a party of your people from their homes, supporting one another against them by sin and aggression. And if they come to you as captives, you would ransom them, though their expulsion was itself unlawful for you do you believe in part of the book and disbelieve in part of disbelieve in part of it and what is the reward of those who do not ex who do so except disgrace in the life of the world and on the day of resurrection they will be consigned to the, the most gravish suffering and for for allah is not aware of what you do so you have this indictment of the Jews here, and there are many, many others, as we will read along. And it looks as if they've done all these terrible things, and therefore they are being punished. But once again, we have to remember, who is it that made them do all these terrible things? Is that takes us to verse, um, chapter 2, verse 7? Yes, exactly. Hmm. It's a law. Chapter 2, verse 7. Yeah. Allah, Allah has sealed their hearing, yes. Yeah. So it's Allah who's made them behave this way so that he can condemn them to hell. Allah is just being good. Allah is, Muslims are just being good Muslims or in, in the context of whoever those people are. They are being good what Allah is ordering yet Allah kind of specially programming them to uh, end up for suffering. Yes. Verse 86. Those are the ones who buy the life of the world at the peace of the hereafter. Their punishment will not be lightened and they will not have support. And indeed, we give the book to Moses and we cause the succession of messengers to follow after him. And we gave Jesus, son of Mary, clear proof and we strengthen him, strengthen him with Holy Spirit. Is it always the cause, it all, always the case that when a messenger comes to you with what you yourself do not desire, you grow arrogant, and some of them you disbelieve and some you kill? Go on. And they say, our hearts are hardened. No, but Allah has curse them for their dis their unbelief so little is what they believe and so when here the jews say our hearts are hardened which we just were talking about in verse 7 allah has sealed their he hearing in their hearts and so it's as if they are anticipating our objection here that the jews say to allah our hearts are hardened like you've made us this way that's why we act this way. And he says no. But he just said the opposite a little while ago in yeah. verse 7. So the here is yet another contradiction. He's, he's hardened their hearts or he hasn't. He denies doing so here. And in verse before that, it is talking about like when the prophet comes, if you don't like you don't like their message because your desire does not match with their message, then you grow arrogant, um, and then you you go further. Sometimes you even kill some of them, and then you bring that in the seventh century. That's what Muhammad approached. How Muhammad approached the Muslims, he brought the message which their desire, which Muslims were desired for, or he introduced the message which. Any man can desire for, therefore he lived happily after, until he mm -hmm. got killed, of course. <laughs> and when, 
when there comes to them a book from Allah confirming the one in their possession, although before that they were asking for a great victory over those who disbelieved. And when there comes to them what they know, they disbelieve in. The curse of Allah is on unbelievers. So they got, when there comes to them the Quran that confirms the Torah, they refuse to believe it. And so the Quran is supposed to confirm the Torah, which of course it does not. And this is why they say that the scriptures are corrupted. Yeah. And the curse of Allah is on unbelievers. What yes. they sell, what they sell, what, what they sell their souls for a while. Then they should disbelieve in what Allah has revealed. Begrudging. Begrudging. Uh, begrudging the fact that Allah should reveal things out of his bounty to one of his slaves from his wishes. They have brought upon themselves anger upon anger. For unbelievers, there is a shameful doom. And when it is said to them, believe in what Allah has revealed, they say, we believe in what was revealed to us. And they disbelieved in what comes after it, although it is true confirming what they possess. Say, why then did you kill the prophets of Allah of earlier times if you are believers? So all this is, once again, it's demonizing the Jews because they say, yes, we believe in what Allah sent us, the Torah, and we don't believe in the Quran. And so the Quran is charging them with inconsistency because of that. And then saying, and you don't even believe in the Torah because if you had, you wouldn't have killed the prophets. Hmm. And Moses come to you with a clear proof. Yet, while he was away, you choose the calf, and you were wrong doors. And when we made a covenant with you and caused the mountain to tower above you, hold fast by what we have given you, and hear what they, hear they say. We hear and we rebel, and the calf was made to sink into their hearts because of their rejection. Say, evil is what your belief leads to you leads you to do if you are believers mm -hmm. say if you if the abode of the hereafter in the province of the allah is indeed for you only and not for other people of mankind as you pretend then long for death if you are truthful so there you go the jihadis always say we will win because we love death more than you love life and they uh, frequently affirm that they love death. And this is straight from the Quran. But here you have a big problem for Muslims that they never acknowledge. And that is that if Allah is the creator of the universe and the creator of this beautiful world, then why would they not love life if he is the author of life? And if they only love death and destruction, as seems to be the case, then maybe they don't love the author of life, they love the enemy of the author of life, and their God is not actually the creator. Evil, comes to, give, evil comes to give, brings death, um, death versus Jesus comes to give life. Yes. 95. But when they will, but they will never long for it because of what their own hands have sent before them. Allah is unaware of evil doors. And you will find them in the greediest of mankind for life, even more than the adulteries. Each of them would like to allow to live to thousand years and to, and to live would by no means remove him from the doom. Allah is the seer of what they do. So Allah is criticizing them for loving life and wanting to live longer. And so, as you noted, Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. It's exactly the opposite message. Yeah. That's what like kind of helps you to think through. You know, when Israel was kind of murdering the hostages, um, Hamas was murdering the Israel hostages. Mm -hmm. 
like in last six hostages that they were murdered they published like some of the um clips which has been um sent out like how even in that like it's talk about how hamas terrorist is asking the lady oh does your father how much does your father love you how much does your father will give you so love to life versus hamas's love is to death why because yeah. allah in here criticized those people who love to live yes it's a it's 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 a bad thing it's it's presented as a wrongdoing in the quran if you love life and want to live which is a completely foreign idea it should be noted by those who uh believe in the abrahamic religions and want to uh have jews christians and muslims all working together and seeing each other as brethren this is a fundamentally different idea from what the jews and christians believe that life is a good and that the creation is good that uh god created the world and every day it says and he saw that it was good in the right at the beginning in genesis and uh, so if it's good you should love it why would you not but here we have allah saying it's a bad thing for you to want to love life you should love death yeah um, shall we stop there, or would you like me to kind of come on till 102? Yeah, let's go to 100 and, through 101. Okay. Say, who is the enemy of Gabriel? For it is he who has revealed this to you, your heart by Allah's permission, confirming what was before it, and a guidance and good news to the believers. Who is the enemy to Allah, and his angels and his messengers, and Gabriel and Michael, then indeed Allah is an enemy to unbelievers. Indeed, we have revealed clear signs to you, and only wrongdoers will disbelieve in them. Is it ever so that when they make a covenant, a party of them set it aside? The truth is, most of them do not believe. And when a messenger from Allah comes to them, confirming what is with them, a function of those who have received the books cast the book of Allah behind their backs, as if they did not know. Yep. So you see where they get the idea of corrupting the scriptures. But once again, here, uh, as in all the other passages, this doesn't actually say they changed the wording of the, of the scripture, only that they threw the book of Allah behind their backs. They were, they were hiding it, supposedly, to avoid having the muslims show them that it confirmed what they were te what they what what's in their own scriptures that the quran and the torah are the same and it's all uh all of this of course is also an impetus to anti-semitism to this day because the jews are presented as so relentlessly evil and rebellious against allah just a quick question so it may it, i can understand that if someone is disobeying Allah, Allah is calling that person as, oh, they are enemy to me because Allah is the so-called creator of universe, all that junk. And then, but what about like uh, angels? Why would someone would be enemy to angels and Gabriel and Michael? Well, remember that the uh, Quran has rebellious angels who rebel against Allah. And so the distinction between the believers and the unbelievers extends to the angels and the jinn as well as to human beings and so uh, if you become an unbeliever then you're an enemy not just of allah but of the angels who are on his side mm -hmm. and a friend of the angels who are against him so um why does allah is making distinction between angels and gabriel and michael because like, are they not the, and are they not angels like they are uh but gabriel is also identified with the holy spirit elsewhere and it's uh it, it's just more confusion that the quran is simply not a coherent narrative okay so you so, mean it's just miracle it's what now it's miracle not confusion it's, miracle. it's miracle yes, yes okay. it's a miracle <laughs> Okay, and um, we stopped then. We stopped in verse um, 
two, we, that's where we will pick up next week. Well, very uh, good. Yeah, before I let you go, would you be kind enough and then remind us again where people can find the critical biography of Muhammad and why did you put down critical biography of Muhammad once again, if you can remind us that? Yeah, thank you. It's at Amazon, it's at Barnes & Noble, and uh, should be at your bookstore or order it there. And Muhammad, a critical biography is a an examination of the life of Muhammad as the earliest Islamic texts show us. But also it's an examination of how those Islamic texts disagree with one another. And that the showing that the narrative that we understand about Muhammad was fashioned out of a very contradictory material. And that it's clear. I don't think anybody can read this book and come away thinking Muhammad was a historical person. It's all just competing myths and legends. So this book will give us more resources um, for us to ask our Muslim friends which version of this story is correct or which Muhammad you choose to follow. So good resource, uh, get in touch, from, um, buy it from Amazon and then read it and then use it. And if you've got any problem with the book, just let us know. We can make sure uh, we know what you are talking about. What is your problem? If with the problem, problem with the book, not problem with Muhammad. I'm assuming you will have problem with Muhammad. So. Well, some people, I know some people will read the book and then cast it behind their backs. Oh, but, maybe uh, that's uh, how Allah wanted it to be. Yes, exactly. Uh, thank you very much for joining me, Robert Spencer. And thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everyone who joined us in the chat. By God's grace, we will see you um, next week on another live stream.